Assalamu alaikum and welcome to welcome to our first um, ch uh, first video on uh, on the series Our Choice, uh, where we basically explain why we particularly chose this book and what's the purpose and objective. Um, so we're going to go through this book, um, Paul and Jesus by James Tabor. <clears throat> now this book basically the author james tabor he specializes in the origins of christianity for over 40 years and um, he always had this obsession to understand more about paul and how he sort of laid out the groundwork for uh, what we know today as christianity but upon james tabor's investigation he he figured out that there was a christianity version before paul and he proposes that we should be reading the New Testament in the reversal order. Because usually when we open the New Testament, uh, we come across Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. And then we see Paul's letters. But James Tabor argues that if you want to know the, tr the historical version of Christianity, we should be starting with the earliest writings. And the earliest writings are Paul's letters. Um, now, out of 13 letters of Paul, only seven are deemed to be authentic by biblical consensus. So James Tabor uh, proposes that if we start off with the authentic letters of Paul, we would be able to construct a, a, a Christianity a Christianity version which was lost. And that lost Christianity version is what is known as Jewish Christianity. Um, so Jewish Christianity is, is basically a sect where they believe that Isa alayhi salam was the Messiah, but he was not the son of God. He's not a pre-existing divine son. Uh, he's not the begotten son of God, or either Billah, okay? Um, and actually the disciples of Jesus had a different version of Christianity known as Jewish Christianity, that they were Torah observing Jews. Now, when I read the Quran, which of course is the, is the last and final revelation from Allah Azawajal, it is the only authentic revelation that we have. The previous books have been, have been corrupted. When we read the Quran, Allah Azawajal, he gives special attention to the Hawariyun, to the disciples of Isa alayhi salam. And there's one ayah that I want to, I want to read out for you guys. Um, so it's in Surah as saf Surah 61, ayah, 40, uh, ayah um, 14. Um, so it says, O you believed, be supporters of Allah, as when Jesus, the son of Mary, said to the disciples, who are my supporters for Allah? The disciples said, we are supporters of Allah. And a faction of the children of Israel believed and a faction disbelieved. So we supported those who believed against the enemy and they became dominant. Now, first of all, this is, there's two points that I want to, I want to pick up from this ayah. Number one is that Allah as well said that he granted victory of the disciples of Isa alayhi salam and those who followed them over the disbelieving people. If you look at the New Testament writings, it doesn't seem to suggest that the disciples of jesus according to the new testament was successful in fact paul was i mean if you look at the new testament corpus out of the 27 books you have 13 letters that's commonly attributed to paul i mean that's nearly 50 percent we don't have a single first-hand writing from any of the so like any of the disciples of jesus as claimed in the new testament but yet we have a man called paul who never met jesus in his whole lifetime and yet his letters have been canonized in the New Testament. So where exactly are the writings of the disciples of Jesus? Why are their teachings not emphasized in the New Testament? And that's why it really perplexed me because Allah gave them special attention and it seems like it's a lost version. And when I came across this book, Pulling Jesus, that's what James Tabor wants to do. His objective is to find out what exactly was the lost Christianity version before uh, before Paul came with his own version of Christianity, which we know today to be the, the Christianity. Um, so this is why, you know, we went through, this is why we chose this book. And um, and it's very important as a disclaimer that when it comes to the rulings of the Israelite traditions, uh, which in Arabic is Israel, Israeli ad Riwaya, Israelite tradition or Israelite narration, the ruling is that anything that conforms with the Quran and the Sunnah Anything that agrees with the Quran and Sunnah, we have no problem accepting that part to be true. If there are anything that contradicts against the Quran and Sunnah from the Israelite tradition, then of course we reject it. Anything that's in between, 
a neutral stance, we take it with a pinch of salt. So we're not saying that everything that James Tabor says is historically true, but what it does show is that there was evidence where there was a lost Christianity version before Paul came to preach his own gospel, which is known as Jewish Christianity, a Torah observant Jews who believed that Isa alayhi salam was the Messiah and they never believed him to be God, the son of God or pre-existing son of God like Paul did. And, um, and this is the end of my segment. Thank you for listening. And I'll pass it on to my brother, Brother Idris. Barakalafik. Assalamu alaikum. Um, I, think that, I think the nature of, um, as to why we chose this book here, and um, why even a channel, if I'm right, Ahi, I had, because I guess the, the decision to discuss this book fed into the decision to create the channel as well. Um, and as you've alluded to the series, after this book, inshallah, we're going to be discussing other books uh, and going through them with yourselves. Um, I'd like to start off with this verse of the Quran. It's in Surah Al Imran, so that's chapter 3, the verse 52 to 53. It's in the English language. It says, When Jesus sensed disbelief from his people, he asked, who will stand up with me for Allah? The disciples replied, we will stand up for Allah. We believe in Allah. So bear witness that we have submitted. Remember the term, what the term we submitted means. They pray to Allah. Our Lord, we believe in your revelations, plural, and follow your messenger. That's the prophet Jesus, peace be upon him. So count us among among those who bear witness. Um, so that's like a, a small excerpt from the Quran in relation to the disciples uh, believing in Allah, submitting to to Allah, and and bearing witness to that and to the fact that Allah Subhanahu is their Creator and and that Isa is 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 the messenger for them at that time. Um, Another interesting thing as to also why we're talking about this, and I just want to emphasize the point that Brother Raihan made, which is that when we look at the writings of the of the Jews and the Christians, that we take it, of course, with a pinch of salt. We, we take what is affirmed within Islam as fact. We disregard which is opposed by Islam. We disregard those matters and anything where Islam is silent upon, we either we say, you know, we either we, we either we don't take it, nor do we accept it in a nutshell. Um, so we just I think it's important that, again, that, that point is emphasized in, in terms of the contents of this book. However, um, I'm just trying to find something which I'm trying to do as I speak. Uh, multitasking is not one of my favorite tasks. Okay, so what I found very interesting is that when, um, if you go to Wikipedia and you and you find a Jesus in Islam page in Wikipedia, it talks about Islamic theology, and it's I'm not sure who put this up, but it's almost by chance. Um, one of the first things stated is Professor James D. Tabor, and, and it's an excerpt from his book, The Jesus Dynasty. And it goes on to say, Jesus is described by various means in the Quran. The most common reference to Jesus, peace be upon him, occurs in the form of Ibn Maryam, the son of Mary, sometimes pre preceded with another title. Jesus is also recognized as a Nabi, a prophet, and a Rasul, a messenger of God. The term Abdullah, servant of God, Wadija, if I pronounce that right, worthy of esteem in this world and the next, and Mubarak, blessed, or a source of benefit for others, are all used in reference to Jesus, peace be upon him. According to Islam, Jesus never claimed to be divine. divine. Islam sees Jesus as human, sent as the last prophet to, of Israel to the Jews, with the gospel, singular, not gospels, as in the current Bible within the gospel scripture, affirming but modifying the Mosaic law. Mainstream Islamic traditions have rejected any divine notions of Jesus being God or begotten or the begotten son of God or the Trinity. 
popular theology teaches such belief, beliefs constitute shirk, the association of partners with God, and thereby a rejection of his, desire, his divine oneness, tawheed, as the sole unparalleled sin, unpardonable sin. Obviously, if you make toba before death, it would be pardonable. A widespread, and this is the last, because I don't want to go on too long. A widespread, this is important, a widespread polemic directed to these di doctrinal origins are ascribed to Paul the Apostle, regarded by some Muslims as a heretic, as well as an evolution across the Greco-Roman world causing pagan influences to corrupt God's revelation. I'll leave it as that. So this is why we're discussing this book, to see what we can find out in, i.e., again, with a pinch of salt, the transformation of the true teachings of Jesus in relation to his disciples, how that was hijacked by certain persons, namely Paul, uh, influenced with Hellenistic Greco-Roman thought and theology, and then basically the Christianity we have today is, is Pauline in nature. How much of it actually emanates from the disciples and by default from Jesus himself, peace be upon him. So that's the nature of reading this book coupled with other information. Inshallah, we didn't know we can provide. Okay, so over to you, Akhi uh, Rayhan. Yeah, Jazakallah khair, Brother Idris, for sharing your thoughts on 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 the book and it's it's quite amazing that how the new testament writers have completely obscured the role of james the just who was known to be a torah observant jew who was the natural successor to christ uh, and the new testament writings only mention james the just twice in the book of acts which i find it absolutely shocking because how on earth do we have a man called Paul who never met Jesus in his whole lifetime and yet James does not even play a significant role, who lived with Jesus, who met with Jesus. Of course, we take it with a pinch of salt, but it creates, it, it does suggest that, you know, Paul's nemesis were the disciples of Jesus. And the way how the way how the, the way how the Roman Catholic Church and the Protestants they try to they try to say that Paul and James harmonize. Yeah, you'll find that in the book of Acts. The book of Acts is 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 definitely authored by Luke. And Luke supposedly from history was a was a was Paul's physician. So of course he's supporting Paul's theology and it's also believed by consensus that uh, the book of Acts was, was written around 90 AD. But what's fascinating, Brother Idris, what I found is that how the author of the book of Acts, who definitely must have authored under Luke's name, how it's trying to make you believe that the book of Acts was written during the time of Paul. Because it mentions in the book of Acts that Paul was under house arrest by the roman emperor nero but then if if truly the book of acts was written during paul's lifetime why didn't that author record the death of paul why didn't why didn't that author um confirm that paul was executed so whoever authored the book of acts um sort of paul tried to deceive the audience that this was yeah. written around Paul, when was, really truly it was written f at least 30 years after paul's passing away yeah it was it was um, paul it was paul and, line and in that's nature. my observation i picked up yeah yeah it was paul line in nature um i think i think what james tabor did is that he's used the, the new testament and some examples outside of the new testament in terms of dubious or not but some general historic accounts outside um to kind of read between the lines and subtract what was going on at the time like you said you know with luke recorded the gospel according to luke and and, and whoever was the, the author of acts um trying to say that you know I put, the challenges between Paul and the apostles, the super apostles, 
well harmonize yeah. when it's not it's not it's not it's not true it's not the fact but you you can find you can find portions in with through through the new testament where it makes an argument that that wasn't actually the case coupled with outside external biblical sources um shall we dive in yeah uh, but before before we move on before we move on to that part uh, i also want to add that um it's very important that we understand that paul's literature is based upon three okay different sources uh the gospel of mark the gospel of <clears throat> luke and the book of acts okay. these are the three sources that you'll find pauline's theology and pauline's writings and i find really amazing how james tabor really shifts the mindset of how we should approach towards the new testament mm. because if we actually start off with paul's writings as the earliest writings mm. then we will be able to understand how did paul understood the resurrection of jesus now yeah. obviously we're not going to give out we're not going to give out everything because we're going to go through the book but you would find that paul's understanding of the resurrection of jesus is not how you seem to be yeah okay. so it's a bit yeah. of a cliffhanger Mm. but definitely you will join with our journey and also also the book of acts you know tries to create a picture that paul james peter mm. barnabas harmonized yeah. but then if you read the book of but then when you read the letters of galatians which is believed mm. to be one of the seven authentic letters of attribute to paul mm. paul actually says that they're my nemesis they're the so-called pillars of the church mocking but yet in the book of Acts, it tries to paint as though Paul and James were getting along with each other. So definitely the book of Acts, especially from chapters one up until chapters 14, is believed to be ahistorical. Hmm. And this yes. is uh, confirmed by uh, Robert Eisenman. Uh, yeah. and you, you will know him, uh, Brother Idris, Robert Eisenman. Uh, yeah. He mentioned that it's a forgery. Yeah. By biblical consensus from chapters one up until chapters 14, um, it's a forgery really um but the book of acts from chapters 15 onwards it's we it's, it's, called, it's called a we document yeah 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 so yeah i, I just want to add that like brother idris so yeah would you like to uh start off with the book inshallah inshallah okay so we don't want this to be too long-winded i'm not a techno geek but i do not know how long we've actually been recording for oh um Oh, that's great. You pay all this money. Okay. <laughs> oh, it doesn't show. Okay. Let me just, uh, no, who cares? Right. <laughs> right. Um, I'm going to start off with the introduction. Is that okay? What page is that? That's the introduction. The preface, right? No, the introduction. Introduction. Okay okay cool so we're on page one okay cool page one yeah okay so introduction paul and jesus paul never met jesus wow wow <laughs> okay let's say this seriously paul never met jesus this book is an expl exploration of the startling implications of those four words yeah but doesn't that but you know when go you ahead, laugh, go ahead. Yeah. James Tabor, i know i know i know god sorry carry on sorry no 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 that, when you know when we read paul never met jesus mm. right why were we laughing because we know <laughs> not, not many people know this and uh look i, I don't want to get into a big polemic but believe it or not yeah some believing christians don't know this actually exactly. which is odd and uh some do know that the claim of paul's meeting of jesus is on the road of Damascus. damascus it was a metaphysical type encounter not, not a physical um meeting jesus in in the flesh with his disciples um but yeah not many people actually know this in terms of believers in general um but like he said what he said is very profound uh paul never met jesus and this book is an exploration the startling implication of those four words i just want to say something um sure. 
most historians in general um, take these things with a pinch of salt, meaning that they kind of disregard the, the metaphysical uh, situations or, or what could be supernatural in terms of the resurrection. Was Jesus actually resurrected? Was he, you know, mm -hmm. did he actually die physical death for three days? And was they'll say no. They may say, yeah, he was um, crucified. Um, he could have been still alive and then, you know, consciousness came back and then whatever. But they won't say, um, in terms of non believing um, historians. Actually, that's um, a very important point, Brother Idris. Sorry to, so, sorry to cut off. So, what Brother Idris, what he's emphasizing on is what we call the historical critical method which is 8CM. So the historical critical method does not take into account supernatural events. Um, so the objective of the historical critical method is to reconstruct what could have happened in the past events based on probability, but you will never take into account um, supernatural events. So of, of course, when Christians believe that Jesus rose on the third day as a physical resurrection, of course, um, the historians would reject that because that falls under theology. Um, so that, that, that's that's the reason why um, that's the reason why when we apply the historical critical method, um, they're looking to seek for a natural explanation instead, and that's what Brother Idris was emphasizing on. Sorry, go ahead, go ahead. That's all right. Thank you. So. That's why James says Paul never met Jesus. Um, but again, of course, it's a startling implication. Um, sorry, exploration. This book is an exploration of the startling implication of those four words. The chronological facts are undisputed. Jesus of Nazareth, quite interestingly, was crucified during the reign of Pontius Pilate. The Roman governor or prefect of Judah in April AD 30, as best we can demonstrate or determine it was not until seven years after Jesus's death around AD or yeah, AD 70, uh, AD 37 that Paul reported his initial apparition of Christ whom he identified with Jesus raised from the dead. Now when, can we pause this for one second course, here? I course. think it's very important that of course James Tabor is a historian um, now, of course, they, they have to believe that Jesus of Nazareth, who lived in first century Palestine, was crucified. Uh, of course, we as Muslims, we don't believe that Isa alayhi salam was crucified. Um, but however, to apply the historical critical method, they have to believe that Jesus was crucified because they don't believe they don't believe that Jesus was raised, you know, up in heaven or, you know, supernatural. So but however, what's interesting, what James Tabo picked up is that when he says uh, as as best we can determine it was not until seven years after jesus death around 37 a.d that paul reported his initial apparition of christ whom he identified with jesus raised from the dead that is a historical fact that's definitely historical fact because the first because uh, apparently paul converted to christianity or when he had that dream like had that vision on the road to damascus that was in the year 37 a.d and three years after that uh, Jesus encountered um, James uh, when he was on the pilgrimage. Yeah. So I just want to make that very clear that obviously we as Muslims, we don't believe that Jesus was crucified. However, um, to be consistent with the historical critical method, um, James Tubbo is, of course, assuming that Jesus was crucified. So we just want to make that clarification. Sorry, go ahead, Idris. No worries, but graphic. When challenged for his credentials, he asks his followers, I have not seen Jesus, our Lord. Have I not seen Jesus? No, sorry, Lord. have I not seen? Thank you. Yeah, no Equating way. his visionary experience with that of, I'm glad you're proofreading that I had. Correct me. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. <laughs> Equating his visionary experience with that of those who had known Jesus face to face. And then he references 1 Corinthians 9 1. What this means. Mm -hmm is that Paul's claim to have seen Jesus as well as the teachings he says he received directly from Jesus came a significant number of years after Jesus's lifetime, i.e. seven years as alluded to, and can be categorized as subjective visionary experiences. Galatians 1.12 
uh, where are we? 16, 2, and then 2, 2, I think. And then yeah, 12, so it's Galatians, 1 to 10. So Galatians chapter 1, verse 12, and then verse 16. Okay. And then Galatians chapter 2, verse 2, and then 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 to 10. Thank you, Balaclavik. These revelations were not a one-time experience of conversion, but a phenomenon that contain, that continued over the course of Paul's life, involving verbal exchanges with Jesus. Just want to mention something. Mm. I think in, I don't know if it's Acts or Galatians, when Paul talks about going to the the church, the council of Jerusalem, he actually says he was directed to go there by Jesus, meaning he wasn't going there because he was summoned by the super apostles like meaning they don't have any authority over me i'm going there because jesus told me to go but yet he still hasn't took the nazarite vow which is a bit of a contradiction because yeah, I, think it, it, I think it's in, in his letters to galatians galatians yeah 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 so um so paul's um exchanges with jesus was extraordinary revelations of a of a nature paul was convinced no other human in history had received um Okay, there were biblical <laughs> prophets who conversed with God. I'm a, like prophet, so I don't know how, where he gets that from. Anyway, not not James, but Paul himself. Paul mm. confesses that he does not comprehend that he does not comprehend the nature of these uh, ecstatic spiritual experiences, whether they were in the body or out of the body. So this is interesting. Mm. So I'm just going to say, read that again. Paul confesses that he does not comprehend the nature of these ecstatic ecstatic spiritual experiences whether they were to quote in the body or out of the body end quote that's very interesting but he believed that the voice he heard the figure he saw and the messages he received were encounters with the heavenly christ wow wow that's amazing. Because like you said, Idris, you know, when Christian missionaries, when they say that, oh, Paul encountered Jesus. Well, actually, no, not really. It was a visionary experience, a heavenly Jesus. It, look, for example, yeah, I could easily say that, look, my grandma passed away two weeks, two weeks ago. And, you know, while I'm awake, all of a sudden I'm, I'm seeing visionary experiences of seeing my grandma. Does that mean I, I literally met my grandma? No, it's a visionary experience. And it, what's interesting, Bart Ehrman, Professor Bart Ehrman, everyone knows he's a well-known textual criticism of the Bible, particularly in the New Testament, it's his specialism. I remember when he, ah, uh, there was, I forgot the name of the podcast, but he was, he was debating with uh, Justin Bass. He was uh, also a Christian, scholar of the new testament but he he's a bible believing uh, christian englishman uh, yes uh, justin bass englishman the englishman no he's american america okay, okay. yeah and i remember uh, bart ehrman mentions that and it's quite it's quite staggering when uh, when i heard bart ehrman saying this but according to the studies in america one out of eight people experience visionaries I mean, that's amazing. Like, do you remember in history? I remember because I did I did religious studies in A levels, and I remember one of the segments that we had to go through are near death experiences or visionary experiences. Do you remember the um do you remember the incident of the Lady Fatima by the Catholics? Portugal. Portugal, yeah. Can you hear me, Idris? Yeah, I can. Yeah, that was in Portugal. That was in Portugal, yes. How many people? It's a mass mass people mass number of people claiming to have seen mary okay uh now the question is just because you have a mass number of people claiming to have seen mary does it mean that they actually met mary no they had visionary experiences so uh, as you said idris right at the beginning christian missionaries don't even know that paul never ever sat down with jesus never walked with jesus like the disciples and yet paul comes and he claims himself i have been divinely chosen 
and I met the heavenly Christ. I mean, this is something that is startling that I find it, I find it amazing how Christians don't even know this. I know, you know? They, they need to read the, the introduction. Yeah. Uh, Paul never met Jesus. Exactly. And I think it needs to, um, they need to definitely look to look. I think what's also important about that, Brother Nihan, about what you just said, to emphasize the point that Paul never met Jesus, never walked with Jesus, never spoke with Jesus, is that his message is diametrically opposed to those of the disciples. The disciples' message found within the New Testament. Mm. So the new the, what the disciples preached within the New Testament opposes Paul's doctrine. Very interesting. That yeah. makes sense. Yeah, and we're going to get to that, obviously. You know, inshallah. Um, because for argument's sake, if he did have an apparition and he was receiving revelation, um, it's a huge form of either a huge form of abrogation of the. The, uh, the, the the theology and mm. we're not even talking about fiqhi jurisprudent law from a mosaic standpoint we're talking theology the actual concept of god which is heavy very heavy um so um again we'll, we'll leave it there for now i don't, I don't want to delve in too deep sure um, okay so then it was a full decade after jesus's death that Paul first met Peter in Jerusalem. He calls Peter Cephas, if that's pronounced properly. He's Cephas. Aram Sorry? Cephas in, Arab in Aramaic. Say it again. Cephas. Cephas. So you're not Cephas. Cephas. So it's K A Y and then Cephas. Yeah. Okay. So the C is like a Qaf. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Cephas. His Aramaic name and had a brief audience with. Okay, let, let me just start this again because it's quite important. It was a full decade after Jesus' death that Paul first met Peter in Jerusalem. He, he calls Cephas, he calls Peter Cephas, his Aramaic name, and had the brief audience with James, the brother of Jesus and leader of the Jesus movement. Galatians 1 18 to 23. So, a full decade after Jesus' death that he first met Peter and had a brief audience with James, the brother of Jesus, who was the leader of the Jesus movement. So it's said that Jesus died circa 30, according to them, AD. Paul converted in 37 AD. Mm. And a full decade after Jesus' death means this is now 40 AD. 40 AD, yeah. Right, so 40 AD, he meets Peter and he brief, briefly meets with Jesus. Paul subsequently operated independently of the original apostles. Wow. Pre preaching and teaching what he calls his gospel. Because remember, again, I think it's Galatians. And, and, uh, yeah, and um, I think so. Basically, where he, he, he tells his congregation there to follow his his gospel and not their not their false gospel to follow his gospel mm. um so again like we said there's, there, there's an attempt to harmonize the the disagreement but again like i said or like we've said and Paul, point, uh, james points out sorry that you can read the bible where it puts more flesh on the bones in terms of the disagreements um you know with them all between each other um he calls what he calls his gospel in asia minor for another 10 years before returning a returning trip to jerusalem around ad 50 okay mm. so he converts in ad 37 okay three years later ad 40 he meets peter and briefly meets paul and uh, james the just the leader of the, of the jerusalem church or the Jesus movement, and then he disappears for another 10 years, and then comes back, I guess, this is the Council of Jerusalem when he's summoned, I'm guessing. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so within 10, 13 years of preaching, he's barely spent time with, with, with some of the apostles. It was so in 50 AD, it was only then, 20 years after Jesus' death, 
that he encountered James and Peter again in Jerusalem and met for the first time the rest of the original apostles. Okay, yep. Yeah. Okay. Wow. This rather extraordinary uh, chronological gap is a surprise to many. It is one of the key factors in understanding Paul and his message. Do you want to comment uh, at all what I had or was it just, no, clearly, just really, it's clearly said? It's clearly said. That is absolutely amazing. The fact that Paul completely abandons the disciples of Jesus. Why? And independently has his own gospel. And as the book mentions, 20 years after Jesus' death, he encountered James and Peter again in Jerusalem and met for the first time the rest of the original apostles of Jesus. Just so, envision that. I mean, okay, I, Paul never met Jesus as, as James Tabo and, and we have already established. Never mind that. It seems like as though Paul wants to distance himself. Yeah, that's the why question, yeah. I agree. Very, very interesting. I agree. And he goes on to say in the book, um, next paragraph is, what this chronologically means is that we must imagine a Christianity before Paul, mm. which existed independently of his influence or ideas for over 20 years, as well as a Christianity preached and developed by Paul, which developed independently of Jesus' original apostles and followers, and with minimal contact with anyone who had known Jesus. So what obviously James is saying here is, because there was minimal contact between Paul and the apostles, Paul, preaching his gospel, as he says, through revelation he's receiving through Jesus Christ, is operating independently, predominantly in Asia Minor initially, mm. from the apostles of Paul, who walked, according to James and others, walked, met, ate with Jesus, received the message from Jesus, the man, firsthand. And that message of Jesus through the apostles was propagated independently from Paul's gospel. So we've got yeah. two gospels operating simultaneously, generally in different geographical locations. One emanating from Jesus the man, one emanating from someone who claims the message to emanate from Jesus. Uh, a more, a more, what's the word? Supernatural encounter. Okay, mm. so we've got two Christianities, if you want to use that. I know James doesn't like to use the term Christianity, at least for the J J James the Just movement. Because yeah, it's yeah. more Jesus because of, you know, they will get that he follows the law. They follow the law much more. Um, but that's the crux of the matter. Okay, um, do, do you want to, well, I'm going to read this next paragraph and then maybe Sean Lee can take over. Yes. Many of the most important clues are hiding in plain sight. This is a true, this is a true for a historian as it is for a detective. I have experienced this numerous times in the course of working on this book, whether researching obscure texts in libraries, visiting to places connected to porn, or just reading Paul's letters in my Greek New Testament. So much depends on one's assumptions as to what is seen or unseen. What is noted or simply overlooked. This book is about the historical figure of Paul, but at the same time, it uncovers a form of Christianity before Paul that was largely, largely, that has largely escaped our notice. The differences between these two Christianities mm. are considerable. The differences are considerable. And we shall explore both in some detail in the following chapters. When Paul is properly placed in this context and within this world, a completely new and fascinating picture emerges. We are able to understand Paul in his own time and comprehend for the first time the passions that drove him. Wow. That's very interesting. So, very interesting. So what I understood from this paragraph is that not only do we do we reconstruct the, the historical figure of Paul and his mission, but also we are able to 
recover the lost Christianity before Paul propagated his own gospel. And that is what me and you are really interested in. We want to know exactly why does the New Testament writers completely obscured the message of the disciples of Jesus and why they have completely centralized Paul's writings as the Christianity version. Um, and also, it's, it's also common sense as well, uh, Brother Idris, that if we have first-hand writings from Paul and they're deemed to be authentic by scholars, doesn't it, does it not make sense that we first start off with the authentic letters of Paul to understand who he's encountering with? This is a question I've got. This is a question I've got. Go on. Uh, we know we know of Athanasius in terms of the 27 books, okay, mm. of the New Testament, roughly three, third, uh, fourth century, okay, probably late fourth century. All mm. right, we've got some murmurings of, um, Justin Martyr and, and uh, Irenaeus talking about, you know, Mark or, Mark or attributing Mark to Mark. We've got this, these things, okay, but it'd be good to find out when we're talking about the compilation of the New Testament, it's compilation in the order we have today. Interesting. Where, where did that emanate from? Who put Matthew before Mark when Mark was written before Matthew, for example? Yeah, and, and and the rest like the letters of Paul and Revelation last, and I believe yeah, Revelation last, and, and all yeah. So it it be good to because it, is there a purpose behind that? It's chronological order. Is is there a purpose behind that? I, I, the, the thing, thing, as far as I know, there is a there is a book by Professor Bart Ehrman about this uh, about the New Testament and why it's been canonized, and also in the future, inshallah, in our series, we're going to go through. Bart Ehrman's book, the the Bible, um, the historical and literary introduction, and and this book basically just covers the the contents of each of the book, um, its historical contents and when was it written, why wasn't it included. So I think when we do jump onto that book, inshallah, that's when we'll be able to find out more about why certain books were canonized in that particular order. Now. There is yeah. one thing that I did, I did find out. I have a book at home, um, just behind me. Is uh, I have the book, um, a, a history of the Bible, um, by Professor Professor John Barton. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, Professor John Barton. He's he's a professor. Um, so he specializes in, uh, in 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 the Bible, um, in Judaism, and Christianity. Has he passed um, away? Sorry, has John Parton passed away? Is he the one? He's passed no, away? no, Dale Martin passed away. Dale Martin, okay, yeah, but but I think John Barton is still alive. I mean, he's <laughs> he's a he's an Anglican priest, he's um, English, isn't he? He's English, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. Cool. And I remember on, um, I mean, I remember in the book, yeah, he mentioned yeah. that he, he mentioned that historically speaking, Mark's gospel was written first. It's the earliest gospel. I'll not say that. And, yeah. Yeah. But then why does the canon that we are reading today, the New Testament, why is it starting with Matthew? Why not with Mark? And he gives he gives a proposition, Professor John Barton. I think it's a very strong argument. Matthew's gospels was written <laughs> to replace Mark. Yes. I remember you telling me this. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. I remember now. It recalls. Uh, yep. Yeah. So there is definitely a theological motive behind ordering the canons like this. And it's also amazing that, as I mentioned before, James Tabor, he, su he suggests that we should start off with Paul's authentic letters first before we even go into the Gospels. And he's, he states that all, all of the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, should be read in the light of Paul's theology. Well, so, and they're heavily influenced by Paul's theology because if you read if you read the four gospels independently of course you're going to have a different picture but then when you understand that no these are written 
in support of Paul's documents and his theology, that's when, when you read those four Gospels, you have a different understanding now. It's a different yeah. historical context yeah. that you're reading towards the four Gospels. Yeah, and, and the Gospels, I think, were probably written not to be put together as a compilation, to be read together. They were meant to be read solely on their own, aren't they? That's what I guess. Correct. Correct. And it's very similar with the... Um, it's very similar with the Old Testament as well. When you, you know, when you have the Chumash, Chumash in, Ar uh, in, in, in Hebrew, it means five, Hamsa in Arabic. They're talking about the, the, the Pentateuch, the five books that is commonly attributed to Moses. Um, uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Now, the Jews and Christians, when they read these, these five books that are commonly attributed to Moses, um, they see that it should be read with harmony, like homogeneous. But actually, in reality, the book of Deuteronomy abrogates the covenant code in the book of Exodus. Yeah, and Deuteronomy, De De Deuteronomy has two or three authors, I think, as well, isn't it, they say? Yeah, it was believed to, be, to have been written after the time of King Josiah, which is 800 years after Moses. Right. And the covenant code in the book of Exodus chapter 20 directly conflicts and contradicts the commandments in the book of Deuteronomy. I think it's in chapter, I think chapter 17. Yeah, I've just realized we've digressed. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no. But what I'm trying to say is that, yeah. what I'm trying to say is that the Bible, is not just the New Testament, it's also the Old Testament, that it shouldn't be read together. They're meant to replace each other. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Yeah. Okay, Achie, if I hand, would you mind taking over? Yeah, sure, sure, absolutely. Okay. Page three. So, yeah, page the three. obvious the obvious place is to begin to begin is with Paul. Yes, cool. Sure. The obvious place to begin is uh, sorry, the obvious place to begin is with Paul himself. His early letters are the first Christian documents of any kind in existence, written in the decade of the 50s AD. And they are first hand accounts. I want everyone to remember that. They are our best witnesses to the true state of affairs between Paul and the original apostles chosen by Jesus. For Paul, this separation and independence, both from the earthly Jesus, as he calls him, and the apostles was a point of pride and authenticity. Is there anything you want to add on, like reflection on this on this paragraph so far? Or Yes, please. I just want to make sure I understand this correctly, actually. It yeah. says written in the decade of the fifties AD. So that's so that's year fifty up until year up to year fifty nine. Am I right? That's the decade of the fifties. Yeah. Yeah. As far as yeah. I know, I remember Robert Eisenman and Robert Price uh, in one of the documentaries called um, "Creating Christ." It, it yeah. mentions that there's no dispute at all that all of Paul's, well, not all of Paul, Paul's letters, but majority of. Paul's letters, the authentic letters, were written between uh, 50 to 55 or to 56 AD. Um, now, the first, the the first ever letter written by Paul is the First Thessalonians, which I think James Tubble mentioned 49 AD. But okay. the rest of the letters were definitely in the 50s. So yeah. Okay. So uh, converts Jesus, according to James and others. Uh, dies 30 AD, Paul converts, what was it 37 AD? 37 AD, yeah. Briefly meets Peter and James on 40 AD, comes back again, and then he goes off for another 10 years to preach, predominantly Asia Minor, comes back again to meet them, Council of Jerusalem, 50 AD, and then it goes on to say that uh, his earliest letters are the first Christian documents of any kind in existence written in the decade of 50 AD. So the letters we have were only were really written 10, roughly 10, 13 years after his conversion and the same year after he met the apostles twice, one in 40 and one again in 50. Yeah. Then he wrote. So the question, it just begs the question, are there any early, because like 10 years have passed and then he's writing letters that, that we have. There could be more writings which have just been lost to time, I guess. Because that's I was a long thing, time, yeah, yeah, possibly. But that's all we have. But it doesn't change the fact that they're the only. So that's the time frame, just to keep it up to date. Yeah. 
And by the way, the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, they're definitely not first-hand accounts. <laughs> but what's oh. ironic, you have first-hand accounts from someone who never met Jesus. <laughs> anyway. Um, should we move yeah. on? Okay, yeah, cool, please. Um, where were we again? Where were we? So one second, one second. Oh, yeah. Sorry. He boasts that he has not derived the message he preaches from men or through men, referring to James and the original apostles Jesus had directly chosen and instructed. Paul claimed that his access to Jesus has come through a revelation of the heavenly Christ in Galatians chapter 1, verse 11 to 12. He insisted that his second trip to Jerusalem around 50 AD was not a summons from the leaders in Jerusalem, as if he were their inferior, as some of his opponents had obviously claimed. He says he went there by revelation. Yeah, I kind of mentioned that, didn't I, before? Exactly. Which is his way of saying Jesus told him to go. Yeah, yeah. So an authority complex there. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. He refers to the three leaders of the Jerusalem church, James, Peter, and John, sarcastically as the so-called pillars of the church. And those are repute, but adds what they are means nothing to me. I want to repeat that again. He refers to the three leaders of the Jerusalem church, James, Peter, and John, sarcastically as the so-called pillars of the church and those of repute but adds what they are means nothing to me and that's in Galatians chapter 2 verse 6 and 9. I want everyone to digest that and absorb exactly what James Tabo is saying. This is some kind of Dajalic figure. <laughs> it is isn't it? Yeah, Proper shaitan. It is. Yeah, shaitan and lintz, yeah. Wow oh. and, and here, here we are we have we have the we have the Roman Catholic Church boasting that Peter is the 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 pillar of the rock the Catholic Church. Mm. What's he called again? He's the, like he's the, the one that propagated in Rome, oh. uh, and he 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 um he spread this, his right? message to the Jews, and Paul spread his message to to the Asia Minors to the Gentiles, uh, but yet, according to Paul himself, he mocked. James, Peter, and John, sarcastically as the so-called pillars of the church. So definitely, there's a discrepancy going on here. Like the Christ, like the Roman Catholics, they're going to tell you, "Oh, Peter is the pillar of the church in Rome," and um, you know, Paul, it, Paul's message was to the Gentiles, and they both died at the same time in 62 AD, executed in Rome. Blah blah blah. Um, they were the they were the true martyrs. They they died together. Uh, but actually, if you if you look at Paul's first-hand accounts, uh, I don't think Paul would would agree with how the Christians understand between his regarding his relationship with Peter. Um, and by the way, um, later on in the book, you'll find out that Peter wasn't actually the central figure; it was actually James the Just. But we'll come later with, with that book. Um, shall I move on to the next paragraph? Yes, please. Okay. Although he calls himself the least and the last, he is keen to make the point that his own revelations directly from the heavenly Christ are more significant than anything Jesus taught in his earthly life and thus supersede the experiences of the other apostles. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 9 to 11, 2 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 16 and 2 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 5. The force of this point has profound implications for our investigation of Paul and the gospel message he preached. He also boasts that he has worked harder than any of them, referring to the other apostles who had known Jesus face to face, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 10. He refers to the period when people knew Jesus as Jesus according to the flesh and contrasts it with his own spiritual experiences. And this is something that you, re you already mentioned in the um, few months ago, that Paul is has some sort of like a spiritual encounter with Jesus. Uh, he he views Jesus as a spiritual figure, mm. uh, but 
not according to the flesh mm. you know so that's very yeah. interesting yeah. um yeah he refers to the period when people knew jesus as jesus according to the flesh and contrasted with his own spiritual experiences including the message he received from the heavenly christ which which he asserts is far superior second corinthians chapter 15 verse 16 and philippians chapter 3 verse 3 Wow, okay. I'm moving to the next paragraph. Most readers of the New Testament have the impression that references to the gospel are generally and evenly distributed throughout the various books. That's what you were mentioning before, isn't it? About is there a theological motive as to why they ordered these particular books? After all, Christians came to understand the gospel as the singular message of Christianity, the good news of salvation brought by Christ. In fact, there are 72 occurrences. Wow, okay. In fact, there are 72 occurrences of the term the gospel, to eongelion, in the entire New Testament, but they are not proportionately distributed. The letters of Paul account for 60 of the total, and Mark, who was heavily influenced by Paul, contains eight. Paul refers to his message as my gospel, and it is clear that his usage is proprietary and exclusive romans chapter 2 verse 16 romans chapter 16 verse 25 and galatians chapter 1 verses 11 to 12. wow yeah what do you think yeah yeah i mean we jumped we jumped the gun didn't we and talked about this before we got to this page but when he talks about his gospel and then there was the disciples gospel in palestine and his gospel being preached in asia minor and for 13 years he, meet, he meets them briefly and the last account encounter was in 50 AD where he then they give him a letter and say go to Antioch mm. they say he wasn't you know telling Jews who convert to Christianity to not forgive or you know to not abide by the I don't want to go into acts and, and whatever but yeah you can tell you know he's propagated his gospel when he's yeah. their gospel and he's diametrically opposed to their gospel yeah clearly and as james says in a couple of pages we read there's clearly a distinction and i think that's why when we ask the kind of uh, uh rhetorical question that's why he stayed away that's why within 13 years he only met them roughly twice for that purpose and and i remember re i forget uh a discussion of, of James Tabora online on his channel, by the way, guys, do go to his channel. He's got his own channel. Yeah. Where he's having a discussion with someone and he talks about, and I think this is biblical as well in terms of the New Testament, yeah, in Paul's writings, I think authentic, that when he leaves Asia Minor and goes into Greece, Papa, um, he says, I think either the disciples or the disciples students yeah, go in, follow him into Asia, where he was, into Asia Minor. And the disciples' gospel supersedes Paul's gospel. Wow. And it and his preach, his preaching in Asia Minor at least diminishes. But somehow, I think after his disappearance, there was a revival with the supposed Dealing of James to Justin, what was it, 62, 67, something like that? Yeah, um, he got more than 62 AD, yeah. Yeah, after that happened, and then he had, was it Simon or Simeon, his uh, successor? There were a few successors. And then, anyway, that, um, that, that gospel, so to speak, of the disciples eventually diminished, and the Pauline gospel you know, took precedence and, and, and was shared. And I think what played a part in that also is, um, I think, I think a lot of the followers ended up being Gentiles, coming from that Greco-Roman Hellenistic, mm. Neoplatonistic understanding and background. So it was more, Paul's gospel was more amenable to their pagan beliefs basically so therefore they were more it was more convenient for them to accept paul's gospel rather than the, the jameson 
gospel if that makes sense which was more monotheistic yes. if you know what i mean yeah. uh, rather than you know three in one and, and all of that let's not go into that so i, I think you know, i've kind of digressed but i think that that's that that's probably what happened um okay uh, do you want me to take over brother Ryan? yeah if you don't mind where are we? I kind of lost my. Where are we? Um, we are page on four. Page four. Most read. Uh, sorry, one second. You need Paul uses this term in the sense of my announcement, a reference to. All right, so I'll pick up from here. Rather yeah. than a generic term meaning good news, Paul uses the term in the sense of my announcement, a reference to a very specific message that he alone possessed. Possessed. The implications of this point are quite revolutionary. It means that the, the entire history of early Christianity, as commonly understood, has to be reconstructed. The standard Sunday school, or I don't know how to pronounce that, catechetical, catechetical. sorry? Catechetical. Catechetical, say that 20 times, view of Christian origins goes something like the following. Jesus came to preach a new covenant gospel that superseded the Jewish understanding of God and his plan for the salvation of mankind. Jesus passed on the fundamentals of this new message to his chosen 12 apostles who came to understand its full implications only after his death. Paul at first bitterly opposed the newly formed Christian church arresting Christians to be delivered up for execution. No authority in Damascus, by the way, for him to be sent there to execute. Anyway, by the, by the uh, anyway, from, from Jerusalem, became the 13th apostle, least, last but not least, chosen directly by Jesus Christ, who had, who had ascended to heaven. Paul's mission was to preach the gospel message of salvation to the non-Jewish or Gentile, which means nation, world, while Peter, lead of the 12 apostles, as you were alluding to the Catholic Church, for example, and I think the Orthodox, led the mission to the Jews. Both Jew and Gentile were united in the one Christian church with one single unified gospel message. According to this mythology, despite a few initial issues supposedly initial few issues mm. to be worked out peter and paul worked in supportive harmony they were together in life and in death and they laid the foundations for a universal christian faith that has, that has continued through the centuries all well, we kind of we kind of talked about this but this harmonization um, situation but again um quotations coming from James in his book here and, and, and you know other evidences clearly states that that was not the case yeah and, and also like just to just to like summarize what James Tabor is trying to say in this paragraph is basically to contrast uh the traditional Sunday church teaching to its historical reality regarding the um regarding the relationship between uh Paul and and Peter basically yeah, so the, the history suggests otherwise from what Christians believe about the relationship between Paul and Peter. Yeah. His, historians of early Christianity question such harmonizing view, such a harmonizing view linking Jesus, his first apostles and Paul. It serves theological dogma more than historical truth. To defend such a portrait requires one to ignore, downplay, or deny altogether the sharp tensions and the radically irreconcilable differences reflected within our New Testament documents, particularly in Paul's own letters. That's so very Paul interesting. Himself. Yeah. Go ahead. It's very interesting because even within the New Testament documents, mm. you know, never mind attempting to recover the lost Christianity even within the new testament writings you can see the discrepancy between one writing to the other writing of the same event and why is there why is there contradictions you know that's very interesting 
Christian origins as an academic, academic field of study has been largely concerned with three issues. A quest for the historical Jesus, comparing him as he most likely was with what his first followers might have made of him in the interest of their own emerging Christian faith, and finally exploring the questions of whether and to what degree Paul, who is a relative latecomer to the movement, operates in continuity or discontinuity with either the intentions of Jesus or those of his original apostles. There is also the related issue of whether Paul's gospel represents the establishment of a new religion, wholly separate and apart from Judaism. So basically this paragraph, basically James Tabor defines what does Christian origins mean by definition? Because, because as we mentioned in the beginning, James Tabor specializes in Christian origins for over four decades. And so he mentioned about three, three things that, that touches upon the Christian origins. So number one is the, to figure out the, the historical figure of Jesus. Because of course we can't really rely on the gospels as a historical, um, as a historical figure of Jesus um comparing with basically what james tab was saying is just compare his culture jesus's culture and his beliefs and he would be a jew hmm. yeah like jew meaning that his ethnicity okay not not as a religion i just want to, want to make it very clear jesus would have been a jew and so the question that james tabo asks is well would jesus have said so would you have said something that contradicts the Jewish custom? And you'll find out later on that, you know, you know that the, the bread and wine, Jesus saying, this is my body, this is my blood. Later on in the book, James Tabo argues that this, this cannot be historical mm. um, because in the, in, the, in, the, in the context of the time that he was living, for Jesus to say such a thing would have been blasphemous. It's, it's Hellenistic and pagan. It's Hellenistic. it's Hellenistic and pagan. It's totally Hellenistic. Yeah. You, you can tell the origin of that. It's, it's not, yeah, from, from, yeah. And also what James Tabor adds, sorry to interject. That's right. Um, what also Paul, uh, what James Tabor also emphasizes on is that a lot of, that Christians claim that Christianity is the continuity of Judaism. Hmm. You know. must have heard this oh. argument many, many times from the Christians. Oh, but it, Christianity is a continuity of Judaism. James Tabor yes. actually investigates that, no, not really, because the Christianity version that Paul pushed for and what you follow now is not a continuity of Judaism, is a discontinuity. Go ahead, Idris. Rambam Maimonides. Mm. Okay, he says, uh... You can't pray in churches because it's a place of idolatry. And not to say, but his opinion is, and Josh, you're incorrect. It's not only uh, Ashari mosques, by the way, but you can pray in mosques because it's not a place of uh, idolatry, which kind of reinforces the point you and James Tabo are making that whether it's a continuity, continuity of Judaism or not. Yeah, exactly. Well, well, so yeah well put well put um do you want me to take over uh uh i forgot i was reading was i <laughs> was no i reading <laughs> if, if i forgot and i was reading i think you should take over yeah no worries I'll, I'll take over don't worry okay it is generally agreed that jesus who lived and died as a jew as well as his earliest followers, nearly all of whom were Jewish, continued to consider themselves as Jewish, exactly, even with their conviction that Jesus was the promised Messiah. To identify someone as the Messiah was not uncommon. Wow, okay. To identify someone as the Messiah was not uncommon in first century Jewish Roman Palestine. Josephus, the Jewish historian of that period, names half a dozen others. Half a dozen basically means six, basically or more others before and after jesus who made such a claim and gathered followers behind them like jesus they all without exception were executed by the jewish or roman authorities so this is quite amazing isn't it brother idris that 
we tend to believe that in first century Palestine, Jesus was the only one who claimed to be the Messiah. But in reality, before Jesus and even after Jesus, there were many, many Jews who claimed to be the Messiah. Um, if you read um, Reza Aslan's book, Zelot, The Life and Time of Jesus of Nazareth. Oh, yet to read that. Very controversial yeah. Book. yeah, it's a very controversial book. But historically speaking, there were many figures that claimed to be um that claimed to be the, the Messiah even before Jesus was born. For example, you have the Simon, son of Kochba. You have, um, I forgot his first name, but he's known to be the Galilean. Um, you have the Zealots. Um, a lot the of them Sekirai. were, I guess a lot of them were opposing Greek and the Seleucid Empire Greek and then Roman rule, I guess. Yeah, yeah, they, they were, were revolutionary Zealot. They were looking to overthrow um, the Roman empire um and 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 that's why they were known for that so they were a political figures they were they were political figures to uh, establish the kingdom of god on earth and what's amazing james tabor mentions that if we were to contrast paul's letters regarding the message of christ to the four gospels it's quite different because in paul's gospel it's about salvation through the blood of jesus christ but according to the four gospels Jesus' mission is to establish the kingdom of God on earth, which is very interesting because that it makes sense that those those figures that claim to be the Messiah before Jesus was born, they would want to establish the kingdom of God on earth, right? They want to establish basically the law, the Jewish law in the Roman Empire. And you had puppets. So you, you had Sadducees. The Sadducees were basically like the what do you call the um, aristoc aristocratic? They were basically Roman puppets. And Herod, the Jewish. I'm sorry, Herod as well, and, and his children. That's it. Exactly, the Herodian yeah. Jews. They they only converted to Judaism, if you want to call it like that, just to get into power. Yeah. And then you had the Essenes, you had the Pharisees. They were they completely opposed uh, the Roman state and even to the extent that basically they they did <laughs> basically they they excommunicated the Sadducees because they were roman puppets um <clears throat> yeah so i think that's what james tabo is saying is that jesus was not the only figure that claimed to be the messiah uh because you know you know christians as you know idris when they say jesus the messiah they always interpret messiah to mean savior yeah they do but they don't realize that in the old testament um, you have three different types of people who were the messiahs. Yeah. First, you have prophets, kings, and priests. Yeah. So there's nothing unique, basically. Yeah. That's part of their, um, that, that tradition, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, let's, let's continue. Um, we've got to be very quick because we've run out of time, basically. Um, what um, about Paul? Yeah. What about Paul? Did he merely adapt his Jewish faith to his new faith in Christ? Or did he leave Judaism behind for what he saw as an entirely new revelation given to him alone that made the Torah of Moses obsolete? <laughs> Scholars are sharply divided on these complex questions and the positions they take resist neat and easy categorization. Some see Paul as extending, <coughs> oh, sorry, some see Paul as extending and universalizing the essential teachings of Jesus and his early followers. So that differences are recognized, but understood to be cultural and developmental. Let me carry on. Let me carry on. Yes, sure, sure. In this view, Paul would be neither the apostle who portrayed the historical Jesus as in the, the living man Jesus, nor the apostate who betrayed Judaism, but one who skillfully fashioned a version of Jesus's message for the wider non-Jewish world. Others recognize this, this sharp uh, dichotomy between Jesus' Jesus's proclamation that the kingdom of God was soon to be established on earth. Can I just say something? Don't forget that one of the reasons why Paul 
in his writings in terms of discouraging marriage and certain other things because he thought the second coming of Christ and the establishment of the kingdom of God was imminent. And that was one of his prophecies, which is 2024, we're still waiting. So, um, you know, just want to make, you know, as a side thing, um, between Jesus' proper, 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 proper proclamation that the kingdom of God was soon to be established on earth and Paul's message of a heavenly Christ. But nonetheless, they imagine a practical, functional harmony between Paul and the original apostles. In other words, Paul and the apostles agree to disagree, recognizing that there was more that united them than divided them, particularly since Paul, in preaching to Gentiles, would have to tailor his message to fit non-Jewish culture i.e. Jew to a Jew, a Gentile to a Gentile. I go much further. Not only do I believe Paul should, ha should, should be seen as the founder of the Christianity that we know today, rather than Jesus and his original apostles, but I argue he made a dis decisive, bitter break with the first apostles, promoting and preaching views they found to be utterly reprehensible and conversely i think the evidence shows that james the brother of jesus the leader of the jerusalem church was well as well as peter and other apostles held to a jewish version of the christian faith that faded away and was forgotten due to the total triumph of paul's version of christianity paul's own letters contain bitterly sarcastic language directed even against the Jerusalem apostles. He puts forth a starkly different understanding of the message of Jesus, including a, com break, a complete break from Judaism. Stop there. When he says a complete break from Judaism, the, I think it's called the Epistle of James in the New Testament, even though scholars believe it's not written by James. Uh, just it's somewhat sympathetic to James. It clearly opposes not following it. Basically, up it upholds following the law, okay, the Torah, the Septuagint. Um, when uh, Jesus talks about upholding the law or not changing the law, and not by tittle or jot or iota, and whoever doesn't do so, basically, but won't um, exceed in the kingdom of heaven. And, and certain other things to that effect. So you still see a remnant in the New Testament. You know, in Matthew, for example, they say Matthew is the most Jewish of the four Gospels, if you like, for that reason, amongst others, that it propagates adherence to the law. So there are factors still found within the New Testament that has this Jameson type uh, understanding of the law. But as... Uh, James says he puts forth a starkly different understanding of the message of Jesus, including a complete break from Judaism. This viewpoint changes our understanding of early Christianity by linking Peter and Paul in Christian tradition, history and art is one of the bedrock foundations of the Christian church in the past 1900 years. How did this view come to prevail? Yeah, there's a lot there. Very interesting. There's a lot of there. This this is very interesting. Which basically what, what James Tabo is saying here is that um there's a lot of evidence showing that basically the the original message of Jewish Christianity that we know today, uh, sorry, that that you know we would it's not accurate to say jewish christianity but for the sake of understanding what we mean by it what we mean is that the disciples of jesus the apostle of jesus like james james the just and peter and john they were jewish they were still Torah observant jews um who still believe that jesus is the messiah but that slowly faded away because of the political context of the the fall of jerusalem in the year 70 AD when um, basically the Temple of Jerusalem was completely destroyed by by um, by the Roman Emperor 
and um, because they don't want any more future revolutions from from the Jewish part, Paul's letters was then used as a central figure to suppress the Messiah, to seem like he's supporting the Romans or he has no problem with the Roman state. And also, it's also interesting, Brother Idris, that in, again, I'll refer back to Zealot, um, the life of times of Jesus Nazareth. Um, when the fall of Jerusalem took place in the year 70, and um, the Jews then went into the diaspora regions. So diaspora is basically the, the Greek area and hence why they incorporated into the Greek culture, the non-Hellenistic Jews. By that point, um, that Jewish Christianity version is redundant now. They don't need to follow the, the Jewish Christianity anymore um, because it, because we don't have any writings of James. We don't have any writings of any of the apostles. And Reza Aslan mentioned, mentioned that the reason is because 97% of the Galileans, where Jesus and the apostles were from, were unlettered. They could neither read nor write. And in the book of Acts, it mentions that the, the apostles, the disciples of Jesus, were fishermen. Um, and they were simple-minded people. But what well, tried well. Christianity is because of his literacy, mm. is because of his literary works. And so when, when the fall of Jerusalem took place and when they burnt all of the documents that is related to the life of Jesus, only Paul's letters survived. And that's why the Pauline Christianity version triumphed. But in reality, when Paul died, he, he failed his mission. Mm. But if Paul was alive, I think he'll be surprised how he became one of the influential human figures in history, because really he didn't have many followers. James the Just, Peter, they were the dominant uh, figures in the Christian faith. But only yeah. because of the political reasons, Paul's writings was the only documents that survived regarding yeah. the life of Jesus. I think, I think the, the Church of Jerusalem we want to call it that i think in 70 roughly 70 ad i think they then they left jerusalem and they and they went to they went to pella and pella is on the you've got the west bank where jerusalem is you've got the jordan river and then you've got the east bank and pella is just inside the east bank i think james tabor and others believe that the Church of Jerusalem relocated to Pella, but that's when their um, influence started to, to, as you said, it started to decline. Um, but I haven't looked more into it any more than that, really. Um, yeah. But it, it, it did sever that that central location of Jerusalem because, if you remember, that's it. I'm remembering now. I think at that time, it's in roughly 70 AD. When the Church of Jerusalem moved to Pella, I think what the Romans did was they converted, uh, well not converted, when they demolished the, the temple on the Temple Mount, they built a pagan temple. I can't remember to mm -hmm. what part of this. And um, the population of Jerusalem was empty, so it's mainly Hellenistic pagans, basically, and who were living there and doing their pagan, pagan rituals and whatnot so it was emptied of jews christians at that time as well yeah so that region palestine was hit really really hard um okay so we're on page number seven uh, yes should we do another page at least um yeah i'm, I'm conscious of time so Okay, well, we can leave it here then, yeah. Um, I think we do one more page. Well, actually, yeah, one more page, one more page. Because it goes on to say, just so where we, where we ended, the viewpoint changes our understanding of early Christianity, but linking Peter and Paul in Christian tradition, history, and art is one of the bedrock foundations of the Christian church in the past 1900 years. How 
did this view come to prevail? The answer seems as clear as it is surprising. Paul's triumph is, ho is almost wholly a literary, lit literary uh, victory, as you just said that I have, reinforced by an emergent theological orthodoxy backed by Roman political power. Yeah, and I think I made that point as well. Um, yeah, anyway, after the time of the Emperor Constantine in AD 306 to 337, this consolidation was not achieved in Paul's lifetime, but emerged by the dominance of the pro-Pauline writings within the New Testament canon that became the standard of Christian orthodoxy. Even the order, uh, let's be asked this question, Wow. Even even the order and the arrangement of the New Testament books reflects the dominance of Paul's perspectives. Gradually, alternative versions and voices faded, particularly those belonging to James in the early Jerusalem church. Judaism, Judaism became a heresy, an obsolete religion replaced by a new covenant. Heresy became not simply an alternative opinion, but a crime. Like uh, what's his name? Ar 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 uh, Ar uh, Ar Arian. Um, what was his name? Uh, Council of Nicaea. Arianism. The bishop. Oh yeah, yeah. Arius of Ale Alexandria. Arius yeah, of Alexandria. Yeah. Thank you. He was he was poisoned, wasn't he? After um, he didn't submit in the Council of Nicaea, he was poisoned. Yeah, I think he. he I, think, I think that he they chucked him out to the to the outskirts. Yeah, then they poisoned him. And then they poisoned him. <laughs> so, meaning, as he says, James here, heresy became not simply an alternative opinion, but a crime. Mm. We find the beginning of this process in the letters of Paul, and surprisingly, even in the New Testament Gospels, that most people assume have little to do with Paul. Exactly. Paul's literary, literary victory rested upon three pillars. Number one, the Gospel of Mark, our earliest narrative of the career and death of Jesus. It's heavily Pauline in its theological content. Number two, the two volume work Luke Acts vastly expanded Mark's story to cul culminate with a final sense of Paul preaching his gospel in Rome. And number three, the six letter, the six later letters written in Paul's name, but after Paul's lifetime, offered a more domesticated Paul, which pleased the church and ensured the, the muting of his more radical message. These six letters are Colossians, Ephesians, Thessalonians, Ephesians, Second Thessalonians, thank you, I've got the numbers, Second Thessalonians, 1 and 2 Timothy and Titus. The master narrative of Paul's literary, literary triumph was the book of Acts. Mm. The author purposefully hides his name and publishes his work anonymously, giving us our first signal that he wants us to think his work dates to an oil, earlier time. He ends his story with Paul under house arrest in Rome, but not relating the story of Paul's death which he surely knew, he leaves the impression that his book dates to the time of Emperor Nero when Paul was executed. All this is per is a purposeful ploy. Exactly. Can we just stop there? Do you remember I mentioned this earlier on that, first of all, Paul's literary victory is based upon three things. Number one, the Gospel of Mark. Number two, the two volumes of Luke Acts and number three the uh, the six uh, authentic letters or actually no all of the letters that are commonly attributed to Paul but we know that out of 13 letters only I think seven is authentic and then the six is not authentic and so what Paul James Tabor mentioned here is that when he mentions that these six letters of Colossians, Ephesians, Second, Second Thessalonians, First and Second Timothy, Titus, these particular letters are not actually written by Paul. It was actually written by someone else, disguising in the name of Paul, representing his theology. And this is known in. Uh, this is, right, 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 right,
Bart Ehrman wrote, wrote a book specifically on that topic. Yes, yes. It's also known in the in the literary, in the ancient uh, world, uh, Sutopographer. Yes. Sutopography, sorry. That's what he says. Meaning, yeah. that, meaning that it's very common in, in those times to write uh, to write in the name of somebody's name, tree's gonna die. But you're representing someone else's theology. So whoever wrote these yeah, letters, these six letters that are not authentic, Hello, they're trying you. to support Paul's uh, uh, theology. Sorry, Idris. Oh, I think you're frozen, Idris. Oh, now I can see. Yeah. Okay. Sorry about yeah. that. Okay. No worries. Issues. Should we uh, should we end it there? Inshallah. Yes, we will end it here. Apologies. Um, no worries. Okay, so we have reached. Was it page seven? Page seven. Yeah. Page yeah. seven. So next episode would be page eight. Inshallah. 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 Uh, any closing comments? Um, I already made a closing, closing comment. You did, I know you were good, you were covering for me whilst I was frozen. Um, okay, well, I want to thank everybody for watching. Um, very interesting topics. We'll try and keep the comment commentary a bit, not as much, I think. Yeah, yeah. Um, but hey, um, you know, it's, it's a, yeah, it's very meaty, put it that way, a lot, a lot to discuss. Um, so yeah, assalamu alaikum. Thank you for, for watching and. Inshallah, join us uh, for the next episode and don't forget to like and subscribe. Inshallah. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam.